In opening my series of lectures on the essence of religion, I wish, first of all, to state that what prevailed over my prolonged reluctance to take such a step was the appeal, the expressed desire of the students at this university. Today it is not necessary, as it was in ancient Athens, to promulgate a law requiring every man to support one party or the other in a civil war. Today, every man, even if he supposes himself to be supremely non-partisan, is at least, theoretically, a partisan, though he may not know it or want to be. Today, political interest engulfs all other interests, and political events keep us in a state of constant turmoil. Today, it is actually the duty, especially of us non-political Germans, to forget everything for the sake of politics. For just as an individual can accomplish nothing unless he has the strength to devote himself exclusively for a time to the branch of endeavor in which he wishes to succeed, so likewise mankind must, at certain times, forget all other tasks and activities for the sake of one particular task and activity, if it wishes to achieve something complete and worthwhile. Religion. The subject of these lectures is to be, sure, closely connected with politics. However, our consuming interest today is not theoretical, but practical politics. We wish to participate directly and actively in politics. We lack the peace of mind, the inclination, the desire to read and write, to teach and learn. We have busied ourselves and contented ourselves long enough with speaking and writing. Now at last, we demand that the word become flesh, the spirit matter. We are as sick of political as we are of philosophical idealism. We are determined to become political materialists. But apart from this reason, implicit in the character of the times, for my reluctance to lecture, there are other personal reasons. With my theoretical bent, I have less aptitude for teaching than for thought and inquiry. A teacher does not, and may not, hesitate to say the same thing a thousand times. I am content to have said something once, provided that I am confident of having formulated it correctly. A subject interests me and holds my attention only so long as it presents me with difficulties, only so long as I am at odds with it and have, as it were, to struggle with it. But once I have mastered it, I hurry on to something else, to a new subject. For my interest is not confined to any particular field or subject. It extends to everything human. This does not mean that I am an intellectual miser or egoist who amasses knowledge for himself alone. By no means. What I do and think for myself, I must also think and do for others. But I feel the need of instructing others in a subject only so long as, while instructing others, I am also instructing myself. Now, I long ago settled my accounts with the subject matter of these lectures, namely with religion. In my works, I have exhausted all of its most essential, or at least its most difficult, aspects. Moreover, I do not write or speak easily. To tell the truth, I can speak and write only when the subject matter grips me emotionally, when it commands my enthusiasm. But emotion and enthusiasm are not products of the will. They do not take their cue from the clock, arising on appointed days or at set hours. I can speak and write only about things that strike me as worth speaking and writing about. And to me, only what is not self-evident, or has not already been fully dealt with by others, is worth speaking and writing about. Accordingly, even in writing, I deal only with that part of the subject which has not been dealt with in other books, or at least not in a way that fully satisfies me. The rest I leave aside. Consequently, my thinking is aphoristic, as my critics say, but aphoristic in a very different sense, and for very different reasons than they suppose. It is aphoristic because it is critical, that is, because it distinguishes essence from appearance, the necessary from the superfluous. I have spent many years, twelve whole years, in rustic seclusion, solely occupied with study and literary activity. 
and as a result have lost or at least neglected to develop the gift of oratory, of oral delivery. For it never occurred to me that I should ever again address an audience. I say again because I did, long ago, deliver lectures at a Bavarian university, and least of all in a university town. The period in which I said goodbye forever to the academic career, or so I thought, and went to live in the country, was so abominably dismal that such an idea could never have come to my mind. That was the period in which all public life was so poisoned and befouled that the only way of preserving one's freedom of spirit and one's health was to abandon all government service, every public function, even that of a university instructor. When no public position, even as a teacher, was obtainable except at the price of political servility and religious obscurantism, and only the written word devoted to learned matters was free, though only to a very limited degree, and not because learning was respected, but rather because it was disparaged for its real or supposed ineffectualness, or lack of influence on public affairs. What was one to do at such a time, especially if one was cautious, of holding ideas opposed to the prevailing system of government, but withdraw and resort to writing as the only means of escaping the impertinence of a despotic state power, though that, too, demanded resignation and self-restraint. But it was not only political disgust that drove me into retirement and condemned me to the use of the written word. Not only was I living in an incessant inner conflict with the political system of the day, I was also at odds with the ruling intellectual systems, that is, the dominant philosophical and religious doctrines. But in order to gain clarity as to the substance and causes of this conflict, I needed protracted and uninterrupted leisure. And where are they better to be found than in the country, where freed from all the conscious and unconscious servitudes, compromises, vanities, distractions, intrigues, and gossip of city life, one must rely wholly upon oneself. A man who believes what others believe, who teaches and thinks what others think and teach, in short, who lives in intellectual or religious unison or harmony with others, has no need to withdraw from them physically, no need of solitude, but it is a very different matter when a man goes his own way, breaks with the whole world of those who believe in God, and then wants to clarify and justify the breach. For that he needs free time, and freedom of movement. It is ignorance of human nature to suppose that a man can think and study freely in any place, any environment, under any conditions, if only he has the determination to do so. No. Truly free, uncompromising, unconventional thinking, thinking that aspires to be fruitful, not to say decisive, requires an unconventional, free, and uncompromising life. And anyone who wishes, in his thinking, to get to the bottom of human affairs must have his two feet physically, bodily on their foundation. That foundation is nature. Only in direct communion with nature can man become whole again. Can he cast aside all extravagant, supernatural, and unnatural ideas and fantasies? But a man who spends years in seclusion, not, to be sure, in the abstract seclusion of a Christian hermit or monk, but in humane seclusion, whose only communication with the world is by way of the written word, loses the desire and ability to express himself by word of mouth. For there is an enormous difference between the spoken and the written word. The spoken word is addressed to a specific audience, which is physically present, the written word to an absent, indeterminate audience, which exists only in the writer's mind. Speech is addressed to persons, writing to minds. Because the people I write for are beings who, as far as I know, exist only in my mind, in my idea. Consequently, writing lacks all the charms, the amenities, the social virtues, as it were, which attach to the spoken word. The writer grows accustomed to rigorous thinking, to saying nothing that cannot be defended against criticism, and by that very fact becomes terse, rigorous, deliberate in his choice of words, incapable of speaking easily.